We proudly welcome artist Samantha Sherry as our sponsor on the How to Love Lit podcast. Sam is a world-class artist specializing in animal portraits. We invite you to check out her work at samanthasherry.com. Tell her Christian Gary sent you. Again, samanthasherry.com. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Live podcast. We just finished talking through the much-adored classic Frankenstein by Mary Shelley, and we hope you loved it. We went everywhere in our discussion of that book. I know I said this pretty much every episode, but I stayed amazed the entire time about how many layers of meaning she had going on in the book. And I couldn't get away from the fact she was 18 years old when she wrote it. Anyway, we talked about politics gender politics, religion, psychology, philosophy, chemistry, the natural sciences, drug addiction, and geography. I mean, talk about no stone uncovered and all the stuff you probably shouldn't talk about at a party. (laughs) She left out sports. Oh, okay. (laughs) Something for later. (laughs) Anyway, that's true. And although I spoke about four episodes, pretty much despairing Percy, Today, I'm going to swallow all that, and I'm going to make an about face and talk about what was good and, yes, perhaps even great about the other Shelley, Percy Shelley. I think he's the less famous of the two. (laughs) Hoo-hoo, ironic, although I'm not really sure if that's true. But in fairness, Percy really is a good or a great writer, honestly, of lyric poetry and definitely worthy of study. So today we want to highlight, uh, sadly, only one. I'd love to do more uh, because he does have some great books, or not books, but works. But we had to choose just one or we wouldn't have time. And I decided to go with the sonnet, Ozymandias. And yes, as much as I hate to admit it, there is a lot to say about this brilliant yet troubled young man. And he will always be young. And because guess what? He died at age 29. This young. Uh, Well, uh, there's a spoiler for you. I I think Mary Shelley would be the first to tell you that people are most often not all good or all bad, although she did create some pretty perfect people in her fiction. I mean, but that's fiction. And uh, we in real life are, are just people and complicated and messy and passionate and sometimes misguided and sometimes good and, yes, sometimes even evil. But it's never just one thing. I mean, to make everything or anyone all good or all bad in psychological terms is what we call splitting. And that is actually a a function of childhood thinking. And so we have to look at everyone like that from Mary Shelley's point of view with all the complications. But for him, perhaps it's even more obvious. And not one thing to me is a wonderful way of looking at Percy Shelley. He's so interesting, although at times it's infuriating. So I think we should just lay it out there and make the case for really the greatness of this man. All right. Well, I mean, although I will say one thing I did find interesting as I started reading a little bit about him is that he hasn't always been really well received by his countrymen. Oh, no, he hasn't. <laughs> or even his family. <laughs> More uh, so. <laughs> and that persisted well in the 20th century for a lot of reasons. In fact, I found some really terrible things people said about his work, not just his personal life. And these are the opinions of people you might recognize. T.S. Eliot said he was humorless and pedantic. Oh, dear. <laughs> I saw where one contemporary critic called his word his work, driveling prose run mad, or worse, the production of a fiend and calculated for the entertainment of devils in hell. I mean, that's a pretty... horrible. (laughs) But it's a very creative insult. (laughs) Tell me how you really feel there. Well, Shelley's experience in the poetry world was different than that of his wife or even some of his closest friends because he was never really able to monetize his poetry. It wasn't really popular when he wrote it he couldn't get it to sell which is really kind of sad when we think about how long-standing it's been 200 
years later. But again, on the flip side, unlike John Keats or some of these others, he really didn't need poetry to make money. Well, let me say this. He shouldn't have needed money from his poetry. He was a country gentleman of the best sort. Born in 1792, his father was a member of parliament and his father had lots of money. So Shelley's life growing up is what we call one of great privilege. He was raised learning to ride fancy horses, to shoot, and do all the things English gentlemen growing up did. Basically what we see in Julian Fellows shows. <laughs> <laughs> and he loved those things. He really did. True. I, mean, and, and I would in, too. <laughs> in that financial sense, he was very lucky. But that didn't mean that he was without problems. I mean, he had quite a few, albeit he created several of them himself. Uh, we should start with the fact that he attended Eaton, of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, but Eaton, I'm getting the impression, can be a rough place. At least it was for writers. Uh, we've had more than one struggle there for the writers, and Shelley is in that club. Uh, other students there were cruel to him. Apparently it was smaller, perhaps shy, uh, and the older boys literally chased him with mud balls and called him Mad Shelley, which was their version of bullying. That's horrible and truly is inexcusable. But let me play the devil advocate, even though there is never an excuse for bullying of any kind, for any reason, under any circumstance. But I have to wonder what his experiences like were really like there. Shelley was not a conformist. And I wonder if this really made it difficult for him to be at a place which, from my perspective, looks like there's a lot of specific protocols and social norms that you have to adhere to. I remember reading, or actually I saw, uh, a letter that he wrote at the age of 11 when he was inviting some kids over to play, and he signed it, Not Your Obedient Servant. And of course, the proper and common way for a gentleman to end their letters was your obedient ser servant. So I kind of get this, this impression, although that's kind of a playful story, that he just couldn't help like taking this adversarial <laughs> contrarian position. And mm -hmm. although that can be cute, it really seems to have always caused him quite some trouble. Yes, and the fact that he didn't learn from that is really amazing. <laughs> so, I mean, there's no wondering about how his antagonistic views got him in terrible trouble at Oxford. I mean, at Oxford during this time period, every student had to sign a statement of belief agreeing to the basic tenets of the Church of England. Well, it it just wasn't in Shelley to sign it and let it go, especially if he didn't believe it. What he did was co-write and distribute a pamphlet called The Necessity of Atheism. And not only did he pass it around campus, but he very boldly <laughs> mailed it to various bishops of the church. So like, atheism wasn't one of the tenets of no, the Church of England? <laughs> no, apparently it was not, but he thought they should be informed. And not unexpectedly, he got the pushback oh, no. that you would anticipate. I mean, he was immediately kicked out of school. And the girl he was engaged to, a girl named Harry Grove, she broke off the engagement and instead married a clergyman her parents had set her up with. Well, she's like, I'm not an atheist. I'm not. <laughs> oh, well, he wasn't really all that upset, it doesn't seem, because of this particular rejection. <laughs> well, uh, he was already into free love at that point. And another thing he was into, which today isn't all that unusual, but it was for that time period. And it made him look like quite the oddity uh he was a vegetarian and he was a vegetarian for health reasons so That's so progressive i must say well so this as much as the free love commitment really labeled him as a radical in the circles that he traveled in gentlemen circles well i'm going to refrain from trying to inject my opinion on this next part of Not his story <laughs> but this is what happened so they have this broken engagement, and then not too long, he's going to elope with a 16-year-old girl, also named Harriet, Harriet Westbrook, one of his sister's good friends. And then fairly quickly, he's going to have two children. But this elopement, elopement is, was not very popular in the family, and his relationship with his father probably never recovered from it. But it, 
it was bad starting at this point and didn't improve because after this, Percy still kept doing bad things. It's like he couldn't and help it. I get this impression when you read his story from his perspective. It kind of reminds me of Queen, the singer. He's so full of feeling and emotion. It can be sincere, but sometimes it just flies off the rail, like these relationships. And even though we have this turbulence in his private life, he is paralleling and starting to really begin to write um, good stuff at the same time that this is all going on. And this is what I mean. So he has these kids uh, with Harriet, but he falls in love with another girl named Elizabeth. And Elizabeth inspires what is his first really famous piece of writing called Queen Mab after the character in uh, the Shakespeare play. But in this piece, uh, which I will say gets mixed reviews, he talks about beautiful things, ideals, a utopian world. So you get this in sense that he's not Machiavellian. He does want the world to be a better place. He believes people can be good. He, they can be better and he has faith and he has hope and all this is attractive. But then when I look at his personal choices, I don't know what to make of it. Well, as we always say, we look at the life of the writer to see how it influences what they write. <laughs> And that's where you can't make sense. Right. (laughs) Well, inside his head, he does dream big dreams and he thinks great thoughts and he fixes a lot of the world's problems. But outside his head, he keeps doing things to get himself in trouble. The next being falling in love with seducing and running away with Mary Shelley and her sister. (laughs) Who were both underage. Oh, my. Never mind the fact that he's already married and has two children. In fact, Harriet's second child and Mary's first with Percy are only three months apart. You can't make that sound good. (laughs) You can't make it up either. And you may recall from our discussion of this very incident when, when talking about Mary's life, Mary Shelley's father was not happy about any of this. He had really admired Percy, but this was just... Too much, and however, his convictions didn't leave him so upset to stop Percy from financially supporting him, which Percy Shelley did for quite some time. Yes, and this financial piece is also going to be a problem. It turns out that if you keep embarrassing your family, which clearly he did, it could result in a loss of allowance. Uh, <laughs> hmm. Oops, hate that when you're I know. 29. So now, Percy can't support this lifestyle. He has no money, even though he's from a rich family. But people don't really know this, so lots of creditors are willing to lend him money, and he kind of lives off this for a while, but he can't pay it back. So he does what Victor Frankenstein would encourage him to do. He runs away. (laughs) (laughs) And the stress of all this results in something, again, very much like Victor. He gets very, very sick from stress and anxiety and inner turmoil. He actually was told he had consumption, which clearly wasn't true. But by the time of that famous summer where Mary Shelley dreams up Frankenstein, uh, he has recovered to some degree. He's in better financial shape because his grandfather died and apparently left him some money. And But because of you know, the money, I'm not well received in England, I need to find a milder climate. They choose to leave England pretty much permanently, and they move to the continent and settle pretty much in Italy. Well, he was in better shape, but that wasn't the case for the other people in Mary and Percy's lives. His ex-wife, Harriet, killed herself, and Mary's half-sister killed herself. Mary's sister's death seemed to really upset Mary, But Percy, from what I can tell, didn't seem too distressed about Harriet. He fairly quickly marries Mary and tries to get his children back. Harriet had sued him for custody, which he doesn't get because the courts consider him an unfit father, which is probably wise, (laughs) and the grandparents will get the children. And again, they have to run away. (laughs) So for the next four years, uh, they're mostly in Italy. And all the scholars agree, really, that this is really where we get his best stuff. He writes about a lot of different things. We've already talked about Prometheus Unbound. Uh, He wrote a beautiful elegy on the death of John Keats. If you remember, he's the poet who wrote Ode on a Grecian Urn. 
And honestly, though, he's remembered for his lyric poems. So I do want to take a minute and discuss what the heck that is, because you're like lyric poems. Uh, And I do want you to understand and enjoy. I'm on this lifelong crusade to get you to like poetry if you don't already. So lyrics we think of as songs and they're different because they don't tell a story. So when we're, when we read normally, what we do is we're looking for a sequence of events. We're trying to analyze a character and because that doesn't happen in lyric poetry, we don't know what to do with it. We're not trained from that because ever since we're kids, we tr- we're reading storybooks and that's what we look for. And so when we can't find it, we're tired and we're bored. And we, and this is what my students say. What's the point? What's this? There's no story, but it doesn't have to be frustrating. And so when we look at this poem, I don't want you to look at it that way. It can be refreshing. And I mean it in the same way that people say fly fishing is refreshing. Although I've never done that, but yesterday I was in a zoom meeting, which is what we do now in quarantine life. And a friend of mine was talking about how wonderful fly fishing is. And I asked her, what makes fly fishing better than regular fishing? Because I kind of find fishing dull. And she said, well, fly fishing completely engulfs you. It engages all of your senses and it makes you focus all of your mind. You have to look at the current and you have to feel the wind. And she talked about other stuff that you have to do, but I can't remember any of that. But what I do remember is she said, because you have to focus and think about fly fishing, it removes anxiety and worry that you may have already had in your mind from anything else in your life. And that is the same thing that lyric poetry specifically is supposed to do. So in order to enjoy it, you have to focus on it and really You have to think about it in a different way because unlike prose or a news article, it doesn't mean anything. And now you're saying, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything. And that makes it sound like it's unimportant. But historically, actually, that's been a very important part of it because you as a participant, you have to find the meaning there. So let me put it this way. When you say something in a poetic form, You can say pretty much anything you want and get away with it. Things that would be totally socially inappropriate in any other context. So let me give you a quick and dirty example. Just take rap music. And I don't want to disparage rap music. I'm not trying to do that. But rap artists are the closest things that we really have in popular culture to lyric poetry. And what you can most, when people think of rap artists, one of the things that you have to admit that they have freedom to say things that no one else says in any other context with very few social repercussions. They can talk about rape and brutalizing women and drugs and anything that they want to say, things that you would never print in a paper. But because you can say it in poetic form, it kind of flies under the radar. And I'm not passing judgment on that. In fact, That's a very important and not very modern function of poetry. Poetry always does that. Thomas Hardy, the British novelist, famously said that if Galileo had said in verse that the world moved, the Inquisition would have left him alone. And you have to wonder, why could that possibly be the case? Huh? Well, it's interesting you should bring that up because not just rap. Rock and roll has worked the exact same way. What do you mean? Well, uh, rock and roll, first of all, is a euphemism for sex. And that became the title of a whole genre of music. And it was uh, a lot of the early rock songs are full of innuendo. Uh, it, so it's, it's saying things, making cultural statements that you could not ordinarily, ordinarily get away with in a regular conversation. Well, that's what... Because they're written in lyrics, and that's what poetry is meant to do, because it's not meant to communicate facts, Uh, and so it doesn't have to be standard, and it it deliberately creates a gap between what the writer says and what the reader hears, so the reader must fill in the gap, so that means when you have to fill in the gap, they didn't say it, you thought it, so you buy in to whatever it is they're saying. And that's the draw into poetry, your buy-in. Yes. Uh, I heard a lecture from a famous Scottish poet named Don Patterson, and he was trying to make this point. 
And he said he took a line of verse and he put it in a computer translator and he translated it into another language and he translated it back to English and translated it into another language and back to English. And you can imagine what happened. By the time he got through with it, it didn't say anything like what he had thought it said. And that's not even a person. That's a living that's, I mean, that's not even a living person. That's a machine because the machine couldn't participate in this particular process. It's interesting because just recently we watched a show that was created in Spain. And of course, it had uh, English dubbed voices. And you could tell right now that the English dubbed voices had missed all the nuance of the original Spanish and it came off sounding very dry and stilted and hackneyed. And and that's just conversation. But what makes a lyric poem even more brilliant than just regular conversation, even though that's absolutely true, is when a poet says something ambiguous enough, you're able to find yourself, your life in the life or in the words of that poet, not his. So his original meaning isn't any more original. It speaks to you about you, but not something that you might have thought before. It wasn't so vague that you just made it up. It kind of gave you some sort of idea that you were able to make about yourself. Does that even make sense? Uh, Yes, of course. That's, that's, That's the whole goal of good poetry. So that brings us back to Shelley, because what he is most famous for is his ability to do this exact thing. And I think this poem is really going to illustrate how that works. Ironically, uh, Shelley, although I found him to be quite a selfish person, was actually not a selfish poet, if you want to think of it, about how he wrote. Only 10% of his poems were actually in the first person, which is unusual. A lot of poetry is in There's the first person. There's not an excessive I, 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 No, I, there I. isn't. <laughs> and his poems are ambiguous enough to not communicate anything really clearly, but clear enough so that when we do the fly fishing thing and you immerse yourself into the poem, you can not only find meaning, but you can be charmed by the language and by the turn of phrase and by the way he made if that point as subtly as he did. So let me prove my point by showing you how this works uh, in this famous poem, Ozymandias. So will you read it for us? I met a traveler from an antique land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in a desert. Near them, on the sand, half sunk, a shattered visage lies whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on these lifeless things. The hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. Nothing beside remains. Round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. So if you're not reading the poem, and if you're just listening, if, you, if you're if you near a computer you, or your phone, you can pull it up. It's only 14 lines. But if you're just listening to it, you might be confused, even though it's kind of a short poem. Um, you might think, what does that mean? Uh, so let me kind of unpack it for you, and then we'll try to look at it again and try to listen for the beauty of it. First of all, it's a sonnet. Now, that means it's 14 lines of rhymed iambic pentameter. Now, let me point out that sonnets are always love poems. So it's a strange form to write for a poem uh, on this topic. So why did he do it? Because you always have to ask why. Nothing in great poetry is ever accidental. Well, you could say, well, I happen to know that he was writing for a competition with a friend and they were supposed to write about Ozymandias. Well, that's true, and that was kind of funny. He clearly liked competition. <laughs> but there's another reason that you want, if you think about, makes a lot more sense. So if you know something about sonnets, and it's okay if you don't, I'm going to give you a really quick lesson about sonnets. The guy who made them up was this guy named Petrarch. He wrote 360 of them for a girl who never loved him back, Laura. Anyway, he made sonnets famous, and people copied his style for a long time. (laughs) I can't even remember how long. All the way till Shakespeare. Now, Shakespeare took the sonnet form that Petrarch had kind of developed, the 14 lines, and the style that 
that uh, Petrarch had developed it, and he changed it up a bit. He changed the rhyme scheme, but he also changed the pattern of where the impact of the poem was going to be. So why do we care? Well, it's what makes things, it's what makes this poem interesting. And if you're so inclined, this is what Shelley did. He took the two styles of sonnet writings, the patterns that they both were using, and he did half of one pattern and kind of half another pattern, kind of I'm not your obedient servant kind of form. He kind of made up his own rhyme scheme, but not really. So you have to ask, well, what does that mean? Well, when you first look at the poem, and if you're scanning it and you're saying, huh, that's A, B, A, B, A, C, D, C, E, D, you might think, uh, why did he do that? Well, you can't know, and you just have to have that in your mind and let it kind of simmer around as a puzzle and keep that question as you look and see if all the little pieces of the puzzle will make sense. Remember, structure, how something is created, cannot create meaning. It can just support meaning that the words are making. So let's see what meaning the words are making. So Gary, from just like an obvious, obvious sense, what's this poem about? Can you give it like a prose yeah, version? Uh, yes, I'll give you the the pro version. Prose. No, no prose. <laughs> so I can give you the amateur version. Okay. Uh, well, he's obviously met a traveler who told him about a statue that he'd seen in the desert that was all broken up. I mean, he describes a statue and the the face is grumpy and cold and there are words at the bottom that say my name is Ozymandias king of kings look on my works ye mighty and despair I think you nailed it so here's the question uh who's Ozymandias I mean that's the title and obviously he's important so can you give us some context well as the historian, yes. As the historian. I can do that. Uh, I don't know any Aussies. It's not uh, Ozzy Osbourne yet. No. no. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, historically, Ozymandias is the Greek name for Ramses the Great or uh, Ramses the Second of Egypt. In Memphis, we love this guy because for many years, his statue was in front of the biggest landmark in Memphis. As you look across the Mississippi River, that is the Memphis Pyramid. I'm sure for those who've ever seen it, Percy knew that. Yes, he did. <laughs> it was coming. I'd like to also point out we have a, a high school in this town whose mascot are the Pharaohs. Yes. So, uh, anyway, oddly enough, Bass Pro Shop has taken up residence in the pyramid that Ramses uh, used to be at, and Ramses has been moved to the University of Memphis, so you can still visit him there. And anyway, the real Ramses, not the Memphis Ramses, is widely considered to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest of the pharaohs. Although a lot of modern scholars think he was the greatest of all propagandists among the pharaohs, he definitely stands out as being the most famous even today of all the pharaohs. He lived to be 96 years old, and his reign was truly long and peaceful for the most part, after several important conquests, but <laughs> but it was also very You can't very be peaceful prosperous. until you take what you want. Yeah, there is that. Because, uh, one of my favorites, because Yul Brenner played Ramses in the famous movie, The Ten Commandments, a lot of people associate him with the Exodus story in the Bible as being the Pharaoh of the biblical account. But there's no real physical evidence for that. Uh, in fact, it's likely not true at all. Huh, that's interesting. Okay, so now we know that Ozymandias was actually a real person. So let's go back to the structure of the poem. The first thing I noticed after the rhyme scheme and that it was a sonnet is that most of it is just one long sentence. So you have this really long sentence and then there's three short ones. And when you're reading it, and I really noticed that when I try to read this out loud, because you have trouble finding a place to stop to breathe, it's hard to break up the first one and you're really not supposed to. It, it goes quickly. So you have to read poems, obviously, not according to stopping at the end of the line, but where the punctuation tells you to break. And that makes it kind of fast at first. But then you have all these commas, and then there's this colon, and there's an exclamation point. And all of things like this kind of push certain things to be more important than others. Okay, so I'm going to go back and read the first sentence. And Gary, tell me if you hear anything. See if you notice anything in terms of tone. I met a traveler from an ancient land who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. Near them on the sand 
Half sunk, a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive, stamped on those lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed, and on the pedestal these words appear, My name is Ozymandias, king of kings. Look on my works, ye mighty, and despair. That's huh. quite a long sentence, and I struggled trying to keep up with it. That's right. Well, the first thing I noticed is there's a lot of S sounds, a lot of S. Yes. S. And then I heard those hard C sounds uh, a lot. So the, the next thing I noticed is that at first, that tone seemed to be neutral or apathetic. Like, I met a traveler, so kind of like, this is not me, this other guy said all this. And then the last thing was where... Uh, we got to the sculptor. I mean, I got a little confused as to who he was talking about, whose hand and, you know, and whose heart. At first, I thought he was talking about Ozymandias, and I thought, no, he's talking about the artist. Exactly. And you did notice the tone shift. The attitude of the artist is not the same as the attitude of the traveler or whoever I is. That artist doesn't necessarily have a favorable view of Ramsey's. And I think that's kind of where you hear that sounds. When you hear harsh sounds like that, that's cacophonous. It sounds rough in English and it sounds cold and it really stands out against the S sounds. The S sounds of the sands in your ear. Then you get harsh, cold statue. So back to what I mean by the reader making meaning, look at the interpretations I just did. Like I made just from the sounds. That's me putting my mind and that was you putting your mind and looking to what you see. So we were constructing pictures in our mind, pictures of the desert, pictures of the mean face. Okay, finish. let's finish out the rest of the poem and see if we can talk meaning. Nothing beside remains round the decay of that colossal wreck, boundless and bare, the lone and level sand stretch far away. Notice anything? Uh, well, the obvious thing is the tone has changed again. I mean, it's sarcastic now. Um, I noticed the phrase king of kings, which is, uh, that's actually a Bible term used for God and Jesus in the Christian New Testament. And there's the, the random capital letter of mighty that isn't grammatically correct even so there's some alliteration you know like boundless and bare and then lone and level and the sands and stretch so how are you going to make meaning out of this well clearly the first thing i think that's quite obvious is he's making fun of ozymandias ozymandias isn't god he's clearly not the king of kings like jesus he's not mighty at least not in this poem he's all crumpled up it's incorrect to capitalize that word in the same way that it's incorrect to capitalize him. Wreck and remains and round also alliterate, by the way, because even though they're not side by side, they're close enough to our ear can kind of put those R's together. So I think that that's important because we're saying kind of Ramses is a round wreck boundless and bare that kind of highlights the emptiness the words feel barren and empty so it's not just the landscape but the statue too lone and level as well as sands and stretch all support that this same idea so it's like repeating the same thing three times he really wants you to know this guy broken up is out in a vast sea of nothing and is a total nothing so what might the theme be? Uh, it, well, it seems to me that he's criticizing Ozymandias. So I guess we can say he's criticizing all rulers who think they're so powerful. And even if Ramses the Great can be a nothing in the desert, I mean, how much more for lesser rulers? Yeah, I think so too. That's obvious. I mean, he's clearly criticizing that this guy who thought he was so great in real life... Who would last forever. Last forever is nothing. So let's go back to the form. Now let's think about sonnet. It's a love form. So who loves who? Well, clearly Ozymandias loves Ozymandias. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe uh, that's all who loved him. The artist doesn't seem to. The traveler doesn't even know him. So let's take our interpretation step farther. During Percy Shelley's life, remember, 
Percy Shelley is a political radical. And on the throne at the day that he was living was a king named King George. Now, would there be any parallel that we could make or would Percy have made between King George and Ozymandias? Oh, no doubt. First of all, at at this time period in history, Britain is the premier world power. They're at the heart or at the the height of their empire during this time period. So Ozymandias is, uh, King George is the Ozymandias of his day. (laughs) You know, just as Ramses uh, is saying in here... um, Look on my works, ye mighty in despair. The British said, the sun never sets on the British Empire. So it was an attitude of it's invincible and it's forever. I guess you could draw an analogy, but uh, I don't pretend to be an expert on English history. I'm way outside of my area. But as an American history teacher, the first thing that immediately comes to mind is that King George is king during our revolution. And he's also the king when England is at war with France. Of course, they were at France perpetually at war with France, which, of course, played into the American experience and had a lot of influence on what happened in the United States or the colonies at the time. Well, I don't think we have to go much deeper into King George to see the point that he's trying to make, because Percy is a pacifist. He's against violence. And, of course, King George is full of Violence. He's trying to conquer the world, sacrificing lots of British young men in the process. So to me, it's very easy to make this metaphorical transition, which you just seamlessly did. And I think the English audience would have clearly known that that's probably some, you know, perspective that that's kind of who he was probably talking about. Something like our king thinks he's the king of things. He thinks he's God. But just like Ramses, he's just a few years away from a broken statue. <laughs> the, the voices just make all of this. Okay. Well, anyway, no doubt. I mean, this poem could be about any king, any political leader, a present day leader, a past leader, uh, Anybody that might be considered uh, arrogant as a leader, which is in, you know inherent in the job. And I suspect that there's a long list of qualifying individuals from around the globe, depending on what country you live in. That might qualify. Always. <laughs> well, this is how poems can be personal, because now we can create meaning. I do want to make one more point before we close out, because I think it's an important one that in In a poem, all things have to fit into the interpretation. So everything had to cooperate together. And so we're stuck with this unusual structure that I think we haven't explained yet. Why does he change up the structure of the traditional poem? How would that support the interpretation of someone being great? Well, then you have to think, well, maybe there's more than one thing that he's trying to say. So let's go take another pass through the poem and say, Did I miss anything? Because I think we missed something very important on our first pass. Hmm. If you go back to the eighth line in the poem, which of course is smack dab in the middle of the poem, there's a word that kind of stands out that's an unusual choice. And he says this, the hand that mocked them. Well, what does he mean by that? How, um, How did the artist mock Uh, them, whatever he's talking about, the statue. Well, an artist, when he makes a sculpture, uh, mocks up, like you're making, you're mocking up something, you're creating something. So when I first read it, because my first understanding of the word mock means make fun of, when you think, well, an artist can't make fun of the guy he's you know, making the statue of, especially if he's an arrogant leader, he'll get his head lopped off. So you say, oh, it's a pun. It's a pun. (laughs) So, and then you think, huh, the artist was mocking up Ramsey because he made his face like that. And Ramsey thought he was being portrayed as strong, but it isn't strong. His lip is wrinkled and the face is described as a sneer. So, the ruler is kind of too stupid or really too egocentric to realize that the sculptor is making a mockery of him to last for all times. Kind of clever. So if you look at the poem in that way, this poem is not only about Ozymandias, it's about the artist who got the last word. The artist's impression of Ozymandias outlived Ozymandias. 
like the power of art, maybe the power of poetry, the power of the written word always outlives everything. And of course, this brings us to the theology that's kind of at the subtext of the poem. So we're back to the King of Kings because he threw in a little biblical allusion. We know, of course, that Percy was an atheist. He made that clear in college, but he also knew his Bible. Every good English boy did. And in the Christian Bible, the Bible says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So here's the mockery. And if you think about it, it's something Percy Shelley would say. It's quite an arrogant statement if you look at it in that way. But I think it's a fair way to say that Shelley, in a sense, is kind of thinking, you think you're God? You think you're the King of Kings? Huh. I'm more of a God than you are because I make words and eternity is in the words, not in the rock and certainly not in the ruler. What do you think about that? I think, good (laughs) grief. There's a lot to get out of 14 lines of poetry. There is. And, and, And the thought like that is really dense, but yet it's, um, it's timeless because in a sense, it's true. We're still reading this poem. We haven't seen that statue. We don't know. You had to tell me about Ozymandias. I didn't even really know that's Ramses the Great. So yeah, in a sense, there is some longevity and eternity into the power of the word. So there's a lot. (laughs) There is. And we'll stop there for today. Thanks for being with us. And uh, check us out on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram. Uh, look at howtolovelitpodcast.com. And most importantly, tell your friends about the podcast. See you later. Peace out. <laughs>